The opinions expressed are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the official positions of the sponsors, advertisers, or presenters. Advertising does not imply endorsement by the sponsors and presenters. Welcome back to the Lighting Controls Podcast, everyone. Today we've got a really interesting guest, Dan Litvin from Pure Tech Group. He's going to talk to us about UV lighting and lighting controls for UV lighting. Um, but just to, before we get into that, I want to thank our sponsor for this podcast, McWong Inc. They're an award-winning pioneer in Bluetooth mesh controls technology that provides a comprehensive DLC certified product listings. They really get into some great hardware for your systems. And as you'll hear through this podcast, that, that they will show up in a moment. And, um, you know, it's really well-deserved because they really provide some awesome equipment out for you for your lighting controls and lighting control specification solutions. Um, but, you know, on top of that, they are a North American-based team where they have all of their project support right in North America. You're not calling out to somewhere else in the world. Um, and so definitely check them out at mcguanginc.com. Also, check them out if you're going to Leducation. Leducation is next week. If you don't have your tickets, get them now. Uh, McWong will be there at booth 2902. And additionally, if you're going, you should check out the presentation that I'm going to be doing on integration with Gary Meshberg. All right, and now to jump in on that with Webster as well, I will also be at Leducation next week. I will only be there on Wednesday. I'll be roaming around the floor. I'm sure I will sit in at Webster's talk as well, but uh, you'll be able to find both of us sort of roaming around if anyone wants to stop by and say hi. I want to remind everyone that this week's episode is presented by the LCA, the Lighting Controls Association, and financially supported by NAILED, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. And I'd like to make sure everyone checks out lightingcontrolspodcast.com. Go there to check out all of the merch, all your latest episodes. Make sure you check us out on your favorite streaming platform. We're on all your social media channels. You can find us everywhere and anywhere that you want to. Uh, and now here's our conversation with Dan. Welcome back, everyone, to the Lighting Controls Podcast, where we just love to talk about lighting controls. Today, we've got a really interesting guest, Dan. Dan, do you mind just giving us a quick breakdown on who you are and what you do? Yes, my name is Dan Lippin. I'm the CMO at Intel Safe IAQ. Uh, CMO is a funny title there because the whole company is built out of engineers, uh, lighting control fanatics as well. And we'll talk more about, I'm sure, but Intel Safe IAQ built out uh, the next generation of indoor air quality improving devices and uses a backbone of lighting controls to do so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, just to dive a little bit deeper into that. So, so air quality control, I mean, what, what specifically are you talking about? Yes, yeah, so we're talking about a few things. So when we're talking about air quality control, it's going to be emerging of uh, some existing technologies we're really familiar with industry. So we're talking about our occupancy controllers. We're talking about, uh, you know, knowing when people are in a space, so we can make sure that we're properly addressing. When we're talking about some of the delivery methods of improving indoor air quality, we can be talking about UVC light, which is just another part of the electromagnetic spectrum. While we may be working with visible light for the most part, UV light has been tested for over a hundred years to provide uh, germicidal properties. But then you start to go into the IAQ side and that's indoor air quality. And so then you start to go into other technologies such as um, air circulation, HEPA filters, active carbon, and you start to look at some of the information that can provide through air quality monitors, so such as particulate matter, VOCs, and other gases. And so when you start to merge them all together, you can have really intelligent systems that will kick on devices uh, that are using, for example, FAR-222 light sources and air circulation when people are in a space or when PM values rise because uh, there's off gassing or something like that. Or if you're using something like a 254 system, then you can deactivate, uh, do that inverse occupancy control, uh, again, using those standard sensors that we're uh, very familiar with. Interesting. So, so I mean, looking at the overlap here, there seems to be actually considerable reason to have lighting controls specialists involved in indoor air quality control. 
Exactly. And so indoor air quality right now is, let's say, a new uh, paradigm in building management uh, technologies. You know, we talk about our lighting systems, we talk about things like our Wi-Fi, heating, cooling, and all of that. But we need to go and look at how we're improving the quality of our air. So not only are people getting sick less, but they're feeling healthier, they're able to think better, uh, less asthma, less allergies, all of that. But to do so, this is an engineered approach. It can't be some commodity good. We're not buying something off Amazon or Walmart or even Home Depot, throwing it into the ceiling, you know, cleaning our hands and saying, look what I did. We have to take a smart approach here, do the proper measurements, and also have a system that's reflective of the way that a space is being used. So, so I mean, you know, to, to talk about that a little bit more, I mean, you know, everybody does kind of have their opinion of like how best to sanitize a space, how to control the air quality. So, I mean, what specifically do you do then to make sure that a design is going to maintain a quality air space? Yeah. So I, I have many opinions about that too. So I'm, <laughs> I have a soapbox myself as well. Uh, and so here's, let's talk a little bit about traditionally how this is used or how this is done. It's done either on one end, which is using some sort of technology. Sometimes there might be uh, very simple controls, you know, on off controls, timer based controls. Sometimes it might be a little bit more involved with like an occupancy sensor. But the idea is, you know, uh, I'm a big skier. There's a saying, huck and pray, you know, just go off that cliff and you hope for the best. Same thing here. You put the system in and you just pray for the best. There's no feedback there. And then you have the other side of that, which is just monitor the air. You put in an IAQ monitor, you have the data right there. And there's, you know, great, you know that the CO2 levels are really high. That's why you can't think and you're falling asleep, you know, at work, but no one's doing anything about it. That's where it's important to merge the two together. So you have that monitoring and you have fine tuned monitoring for all of this. You have the occupancy, you have the PM, you have the VOCs, you have all these things. And then you have a feedback loop so that when it is identified that there are high levels, well, just knowing isn't enough. Let's do something about it. Let's kick on these devices. And when we're talking about technologies, this is a place where when, for example, the COVID pandemic started, there was a, uh, a mad race to do something. And unfortunately, there was a lot of snake oil sales going on at that time. A lot of technologies that were uh, very new, promising the world, um, or let's say just very cheap and easy to put in. And we're finding that a lot of these technologies um, are starting to have some negative byproducts and doing more harm than good. And so it's also to using scientifically proven technologies, uh, UVC light 254, so long as there's no direct exposure. Far UV uh, 222 uh, is the common one. Uh, that is safe for exposure and the ACGIH uh, limitations for exposure just were raised in January. So it's essentially you can have it on uh, for more or less all day. Uh, and you are safe there. And then combining with some of these tried and true methods, um, again, uh, filters, HEPA, active carbon is great. And if we can get fresh air from outside, that's great as well. But with uh, our rapidly urbanizing landscape inside of cities, not the best. And I live uh, in the Pacific Northwest from September until the rain season starts, it's wildfire season. And so mm. I actually had last year, I was on the balcony, my door is open, and the fire alarm went off uh, after Jeez. the door is open for about three minutes. <laughs> so that won't always work too. Wow. Yeah. I, we're, we're on the East Coast, so that's that's kind of yep. new to, to me anyways. But um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So yeah, I mean, fresh air is not always a good solution. So having some fil filtered air is probably better in that situation where you have wildfires polluting the environment or general urban pollution. But, um, you know, I'm curious, what what other negative effects are you referring to regarding these other technologies? Yeah, so we've seen uh, with a technology that is known as ionization. Ionization is a, a funny technology because it's one that seems to be very uh, marketing driven. And it came around in the early 90s, and it seems to have this Phoenix-like effect where it'll come into being, sell a lot, 
uh, you know, a dangerous byproduct will be discovered, it'll die off, and they'll be reborn under a new name. This is the same thing that if you are, if you remember uh, the sharper image, that amazing store in the shopping malls where you can sit in the massage chairs all day. I remember cutting school and sitting in those and doing that. <laughs> um, they had a device called the Ionic Breeze, and that was an ionizer device. Well, it was discovered that was uh, creating ozone as a byproduct. And ozone, especially at certain quantities, is toxic for the lungs. So a lot of these uh, technologies are creating these byproducts. What we're seeing with the current generation of ionizers, needlepoint and bipolar, is one of two things. Either one, they're doing a testing in literally what's called a shoebox setting. So it's a box the size of a shoebox. And they're pumping in about 10 times as many ions as they would do in a normal space. And so they're uh, having results which aren't really indicative of the real world. Or uh, what we're seeing is that there's uh, off-gassing and byproducts. So these charged particles will flow through the air, bounce off of some of the gases in the air, maybe a plastic, maybe some other materials in a room, and will create a VOC, volatile organic compound. And those over long term uh, do havoc for the lungs. And so that is going to be one of the major byproducts that we see there. We see ozone generators, which ozone on its own does uh, reduce pathogens in the air, but needs a time for uh, dissipation uh, on its own. So a couple hours, open the windows, let it clear out. We're even seeing with uh, chemical usage. So in March of 2020, so right after the pandemic started, there was a spike of about 60, 60% uh, to the CDC Poison Control Center due to the fumes and vapors of, uh, of the chemical cleaners that people were using. So even the chemical cleaners that we typically use are gonna produce VOCs and in very intense amounts. So there, that should still be mitigated, opening the window, having a dry time and the proper usage. So we're not always using these uh, technologies the right way. A lot of times they're causing more harm than good. And again, because we don't have that data, which we're getting from our monitors and the controls from that, we're not always sure of what it actually is doing. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess from your standpoint with, with your business model, really what you're saying is, you know, you don't know until, until you actually have the, the hard data in front of you. You know, you could be living just fine with what you have in, in your office, in your house, whatever. But it also could be that that what you're living in is actually quite a toxic environment. And until you have that confirmation of data, you won't know. And it, it, it kind of rings to me like with uh, public water, you know, you won't know what's in your public water unless you get it tested. Exactly. And then the great analogy there is when we're talking about public water, one of the major ways that we disinfect is with UV lighting. That was actually historically the first major implementation of UV lighting for disinfection. I believe it was in like a 1909 was the water or the wastewater treatment in Marseille, France. And ever since it's been used for that purpose uh, of keeping uh, public water safe for consumption. So that was a really good segue. I don't even know if you meant to do that. <laughs> nope. Did not mean to do that. In fact, that, was, that was new information for me. So I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So, so at any rate, so UV lighting, I mean, that's, that's a buzzword right now in our industry. And I feel like there is a lot of snake oil that, that gets sold regarding, you know, technologies with UV lighting. So from your standpoint, it sounds like, you know, UVC at a certain wavelength and UVA at a certain wavelength are good for, for, sanitization purposes so it's just going to be uvc uh so mm. uv is there's three four different types of it so uva b and c we're familiar with then you have other places some will call it uvv some will call it um, vacuum uv different names which is uh, pretty much only occurs in a vacuum we don't have to think about that but uva is what 95 percent of naturally occurring uv on earth is uh, that is what gives us our bronze skin in the sun. As you can see, I've not been out in the sun. It's rainy season here <laughs> in the Pacific Northwest, so I haven't been exposed to too much UVA. About 5% of what comes through the earth and most of the other uh, part of it is filtered from the ozone layer. It's gonna be UVB. 
UVB is going to be the most dangerous wavelength of UV because it's energetic enough to penetrate deeply into our skin and eye layers, into the uh, cell generative layers. And so from the energy, that's where you get things like melatoma um, and some of the uh, eye cancers associated with overexposure of UV. UVC, that's where you get that unique aspect of the germ's hot property because it has a energetic enough um, source or a high enough energy where it can penetrate to the DNA and RNA of pathogens and it doesn't kill them. It just pretty much neuters them. And so they can't replicate because they can't replicate. They can't infect and really do anything. But with that wavelength, when we're talking about the standard UVC that we use at 254 nanometers, 254 because that's what can be produced readily with essentially what's fluorescent technology, something again, that we've been using for a long time. Uh, at that place, we have uh, the ACGIH recommends six millijoules per centimeter squared over an eight hour period. So that pretty much means avoid exposure because what will happen is a reddening and irritation of the skin and eyes. Now it can't penetrate like UVB into those uh, base layers that develop the new cells, but it can give a really, really gnarly skin burn or this um, uh, sensation it's called uh, photokeratitis. It feels like someone threw sand in your eyes. Don't want that, not a good time. Now we have UV, uh, far UV. So that's going to be from around the uh, 210 to 230 nanometer range. This is something that's been studied for about 15, 20 years. A lot of pioneering work with uh, Dr. Brenner from Columbia University. And this has been found to not be able to penetrate into the dead skin cells on our skin and it can't penetrate through the lens of the eye. So that means that it can't do any damage. Testing has been done on a huge dosage and there's been no damage at all. And it also has a dual effect where not only does it get into the RNA and DNA of the pathogens, which are very small, so it can get into them, but it won't get to us. But it also will start to break down some of the protein walls in our gram-positive bacteria and viruses. So if for example, something like SARS-CoV-2, you get a much smaller dosage that's needed to treat with far UV rather than uh, 254 nanometer UV. So it does have a huge amount of promise. It is, uh, in my opinion, the future of UV, right? Not just uh, a little bit pricier uh, than 254. Well, sure. And so, so I mean, you've got these two choices in, in a way of, um, disinfecting or, or at least taking care of certain pathogens um, and one you can be in the space with while it's on and one you can't and I imagine that's also a major choice when it comes to lighting controls yes yes it is and so that's where again we need some intelligence um, in it we our company name is Intel safe uh, it was not a a smart name because we just combined the two most major parts of what we're trying to do, the intelligence and the safety, right? And for a system to remain safe, it needs to be intelligent. If we're using a 254 nanometer source, the light cannot have direct exposure to people. You need sensors to block that. You need schedule and functionality. You also want things like group control. So let's say you have a uh, classroom, for example. You have a classroom with two different doors. Uh, you have four or five devices in there. You want to make sure that if someone walks in through one door, that all the units turn off. And if they walk through the other door, all the units turn off. So having that zone control, and then, then you can take it a step further where a lot of the implementations we've done are in existing buildings. So no contractor wants to go in, run new power lines, run you know low voltage cable between all the fixtures into a processor and do some you know fancy, crest strong version uh, you know, implementation. So that's where we get Bluetooth controls can be so powerful. Uh, and we've been using uh, Mikwa and Kasabi uh, enabled sensors for this reason, where you create this local mesh network, you have that group control, you have a nice mesh throughout, and then you can also take all of that data, put it through a gateway and then transmit it to the web. So then you can get a dashboard access from anywhere in the world, monitor multi-facilities, see exactly what was going on, share that with, let's say for a school, again, parents, share it with community members. Hey, we are actively protecting your kids. 
this is what's happening, you know, live right now. And from that place, you're able to improve, again, not just physically, but the mental, emotional well-being of occupants and communities. And that really is, you know, I think, an important aspect of where buildings need to go, of being smarter, of being more human-centric. You know, we've heard human-centric lighting for a long, long time. This is a next step in that development. So I'm curious, so how, you know, as you mentioned, there was a lot of snake oil, especially during COVID. I think at this point, we've all seen the, uh, the handheld wands that you could get at your local mm -hmm. convenience store. Uh, yes. You know, so how has controls changed for you pre and post COVID? Because I know that there was immediately a ton of regulations that changed as all of this stuff started rolling out sort of from various entities, right? So how has that changed your sort of controls, designs, and layouts over the last couple of years? Yeah. So first off, thank you so much for pointing out the ones. Um, it's, uh, every now and then when I need to, you know, blow off a little steam, I'll just type in UVC into Amazon and just see all the stuff and that'll be my, like, my stress relief right there. Um, but yeah, to answer that question, so what's actually been really interesting and uh, even as a market in general with addressing IAQ, uh, you know, we have some people, you know, I'll be talking to friends about what I do and they'll say, oh, you know, that must have been so great during COVID. And then they'll ask like, what do you do now? As if, you know, everything's been solved. As if we're done. <laughs> right. <laughs> so thanks guys. But uh, what we're looking at right now is actually a approach of facility managers, which is much more nuanced. And so to, on the control side, while before someone was looking for like a portable unit, just throw it in a room, turn it on and let it run, uh, you know, quick, cheap, blunt, you know, brunt force, whatever it took. That was the approach during COVID, you know, very responsive. Mm -hmm. Now people are looking at a more proactive, nuanced approach. So it is now, how do we implement this throughout our entire facility? How do we know it's working? How do we go and make sure that this is future ready? So if you know, the next pandemic or next pathogen comes out and the dosage to treat it is twice as high. How can we make sure that this system that we're, you know, this infrastructure adjustment we're making now, this investment we're making now is going to pay off then. And that's where controls come in. Because we have UV light has been you know, used, as I said, 100 plus years. Uh, every pathogen that's been tested against has been effective. It's just about the dosage that it needs. And so if you can alter what that dosage is with the controls, if you can do it simply and empower facility managers to start to take control of their own facility through user-friendly uh, interfaces, then all of a sudden they have something that's going to be you know, ready. And that's what they're looking for now. It's proof and it's a future readiness. And so I'm curious, um, when it comes to like future pathogens, I mean, with, with pathogens in general, are you able to test the air for those? Yeah, so that's, that's the fun and interesting one is we have, you know, for particulate matter, we have great sensors for VOCs of all sorts, for ozone, CO2, CO, radon, all that stuff, we have sensors. For pathogens, we don't have a little sensor that we can plug into the wall. The best way to measure real life is to take a sample and investigate into a lab. But what you can do, and this is something that the uh, RESET standard, uh, RESET is an organization that uh, is pretty much advocacy and regulation for air quality monitors. Uh, they've come up with what they call the viral index. And the viral index takes into account many different factors. And based on those factors, uh, we'll be able to provide a score of what are the chances that there is going to be a high amount of viral particles in the air? And some of those factors are going to be relative humidity, temperature, uh, particulate matter, and then CO2. And CO2 is such a cheeky little thing. Uh, every time I think about that, I smile because this is the ingenuity of researchers and engineers. So if we're in a room, we're exhaling, CO2 rises. So that was their cheeky way of saying, if we have high CO2, that means there's a lot of people in that room, and that means that the chance of someone being sick and infecting others is going to go up right there. And so they take those factors, they put out the score, and so we can estimate it that way. And then also through UV, we have well-established dosages that have been lab-tested, peer-reviewed, cross-referenced, 
And so what we can do is we can calculate the dosage that we achieved in a room, put the average on it, and then for the sake of you know engineering safety, you know, add a buffer. So mm -hmm. add 25, 30% increase on that, what that dosage is supposed to be. And then we're able to monitor what kind of disinfection rate we're achieving based on that uh, dosage that we achieved. So I just want to reiterate what you, what you just said, because I think it's fascinating um, that, you know, how you're, how you're achieving this, but basically you can't directly measure a pathogen's presence in a space, but what you can do is you can measure the ambient space uh, environment, the humidity, temperature, CO2 levels with your sensors. And based on an algorithm that Reset has created, make an assessment of how likely it is that pathogen spread can happen in that space and exactly. use that use that data to then dial in a disinfection period that would be best for that space exactly exactly and then so that way especially now with far uh, uv and that's where it's such a game changer because just the air uh, circulation can't touch surfaces and the range of it is limited we think about the uh, light beam, you know, a light beam and the range that it can uh, touch is going to be much more than the circulation of air, even if it's an air handling unit, whatever it might be. So then you combine those technologies and exactly you see the viral index is high. You see that there's a high amount of particulate uh, matter. You see that there's a lot of VOCs for whatever reason there is. You go and you take you know, higher fan speed inside of the circulatory system. You take a higher amount of far UV dosage out there, mitigate the risk, get it back down, and then you taper it off. And the fan's going to run a little bit quieter. You're going to have a longer lifespan with the lamps, and you don't need to go up waste extra energy and all that. So you have a smart, responsive system based on the input. So it's not just control on, off, timer but it's this really responsive, interactive, and proactive system that's based on the actual engagement and actual function of each unique space. So how are you, or I guess where, uh, right? Where are you monitoring those CO2 levels and then how is it affected by HVAC systems, right? So if, the H, if it's super hot out and the HVAC is running at full tilt already, how does that affect the levels in the room if the room's full of people? Yeah, so in that case, again, we want to create a system that works, right? And I think that's ultimately what you're, what's important here is if you solve a problem and you, you know, provide a help, the best way, transparency, uh, transparently and honestly, then, you know, things are going to go and pay off in every way. So in that case, let's say the HVAC system, exactly, it's summer, it's blowing, and you have a proper modern HVAC system that is doing fresh air exchanges. Well, then the UV and, you know, air purification technology that, you know, any IntelliSafe device we're putting in there, it can kind of relax a little bit. It's going to be operating what we call whisper mode. You know, it's nice, quiet, you know, run of the mill mode. Maybe it'll, you know, still do its far UV disinfection, but it might not be, you know, going at such high dosages. And then winter hits, or we see from an AQI, uh, air quality index monitor, so an outdoor air quality monitor that, again, wildfire season, or it's pollution, or uh, God forbid, you know, something like what we saw in Ohio happened, and now we have these particulates, you know, moving throughout the whole Northeast, and we see that there's bad air, air quality. Well, then in that case, the actual HVAC system can go and relax a little bit. Maybe they're just recirculating air, not bringing in from the outside, and then the IntelliSafe system can go and do the brunt of the work. And so you have that smart system, and the monitors are going to be local to where the people are. We need to make sure that we have real life data. We don't want idealized data. We've seen technologies where they put the sensors inside of their air quality improving chamber. So they're showing the data of the cleanest, sparkliest, sparkliest place that they possibly can. And it's great for sales, but it's not great for real world applications. So we'll have sensor arrays right on the wall as recommended by ASHRAE. Uh, about six feet off the floor in a populated space that's producing real life data and is using those Bluetooth controls to transmit that over to the to the actual fixtures in the area. So we have that real life communication and real life data. I, that that that's so cool. And, you know, I, I just I'm curious, you know, if 
people want to achieve this? You know, what, what kind of effort, what kind of design work do you really need to put in to, to like, say somebody listening to this is like, I want to do this for my house or, or I want to do this yeah. for my giant headquarter or office building. You know, what, what are we looking at? Yeah. So in that case, that's something where, uh, for right now, it is our engineering team that would, you know, take care of that, but that'll be something where we're getting floor plans and we can do it in multiple ways, right? So we can do this, let's say simpler basic option where we take floor plans and we're measuring it out based on uh, standard square footage uh, achieved. And we can go all the way to getting on site with our monitors, seeing what the damage is, seeing the way that spaces are used. And from there, basing up what kind of devices we're putting in the space off of that. You know, if we have, for example, a, uh, a well-used gym, right, where people are sweating, breathing a lot, um, all that, well, maybe we're putting in more devices and even maybe more monitors than a space that's like a single person office where it's the same person occupying his or her own space uh, all the time where, you know, there's no new novel pathogens uh, really coming in. And so we can do things a little bit simpler just to make sure that, you know, PM, VOC and gas buildup doesn't really increase. So it, it'll depend on what the client's engagement is. And we love it when a client comes in and says, we want a long lasting validated uh, to the nine system. We you know, care about our people. We want all the performance increases, the you know, redu reduction of absenteeism and all that stuff that comes with it. Cause then we can really go to town, but it's also been times where uh, something simpler has been implemented because honestly, at the end of the day, uh, IAQ is a layered and tiered approach and doing something is still better than nothing. Um, and so that's something that's worth being applauded and um, things could always be increased and added on to at a later date and time. And so you, you mentioned Bluetooth technology and I guess this is where the overlap between lighting controls and, and what you do uh, comes in because um, do you actually provide the lighting controls components or are you integrating with lighting control systems? Yeah, so we like to uh, play friendly with what exists. You know, I don't think any client, uh, let's talk about, you know, a big corporate office building wants 10 different systems for their HVAC, for their lighting, for their lighting and now their UV lighting and all these different things. So we can go from the point of connecting into an existing BMS system all the way through creating our own. So when it is our own, uh, we do work with Kasambi. Uh, we've been very happy with what they provide. Uh, for hardware, we tend to use uh, McWang as our stock, but we are flexible with working with different lighting control manufacturers, as well as different BMS systems. Uh, so again, the goal is to have a usable system and we want to empower the users um, and even to a degree, uh, the occupants as well. Uh, and so we'll be flexible on that side. Our biggest thing is going to be the, the software brains, the way that we communicate it, uh, we can go and arrange. So, so how do you how do you connect with the lighting control system? Is there a device that you have? Yeah. So, if the lighting control system is, let's say, a um, a Lutron system, right? Well, then in that case, most likely we're going to be using a Lutron Backbone for our uh, system as well, right? Or it's a True Blue system or a Kasambi system, whatever it is. Uh, that way. Especially if it's a blue, if it's a Bluetooth based system, having that nice strong mesh is a really uh, good adder to have. And so, is that having two different mesh systems that are at odds with one another and maybe interfering with one another? If we can all be on the same uh, mesh network with the same uh, language that's being spoken, we're just strengthening that up. And then, especially if we do start to bring in things like uh, gateways and that type of intelligence to connect it to the internet then it just makes it so much stronger and so much more dependable. But I guess I'm, I'm a little unclear how you connect with the Lutron system. Is it that you're using Lutron's components only or? Co correct. So we would be in that case using just full on Lutron sensors. So that's it. So okay. yeah, so the actual, most of the intelligence isn't so much in the sensors themselves. It's the way that the sensors are being used. So it is something that we do tend to uh, use regardless a gateway based device and then input 
on our own through uh, the APIs, the WebSocket, and all that stuff, the information that we want out there. But in terms of the base controls, it's is there occupation going on? In terms of the air quality monitors, uh, those have their own language and we're taking the triggers that they have and we're taking those triggers and say, hey, when you've reached this threshold, which can be defined by the facility, uh, defined by our recommendations, can be altered, this means go and trigger uh, this action of the fixtures. Hey, uh, the PM value is high. That means turn the fan speed to 75%. Hey, the PM value after five minutes hasn't really been going down. Okay, fans be now up to 100%. And so it's going to be that uh, language right there. And most of it's going to be happening uh, wirelessly. The only time we'll need to go and connect in a hardwired way is if we are connecting into a BACnet based BMS system. And then in that case, you just have your little IO device that we just wire right into and then write up some code to uh, help get those triggers uh, understood. Interesting. So, so I mean, as far as the, the overlap here, there, there's not as significant an overlap with the devices, but it, it's more the software that, that's really the, the, the big component that you're offering. And so you provide an API to tap into the system and you create your own dashboard that people can access via that API. So, I mean, really, you're doing a huge amount of integration work here to provide this, this system. And I would say that it's pretty much building automation design that you're, you're doing here. It's not just a simple lighting control system. Yeah, I mean, thank you. <laughs> Agreed. Uh, yeah, so it, it definitely is. And it is uh, taking, it's flexing lighting controls. Right? It's, mm -hmm. it's taking them, squeezing them, and really getting everything that they can do out of them uh, through uh, you know, exactly that, using the building, manage, uh, building automation, through using some of the intelligence there. Um, and then you get to fund different types of opportunities where, um, you know, based on what the building is trying to do, you, know, you have all sorts of wonderful fun sensors and toys out there. You, know, you can go into sensors like people counters and if it's, let's say you have a ballroom conference, you know, convention hall, something like that, well, then you can have something where, okay, after you've had X amount of people are entering into that space, ambient noise will be something. Maybe we're not too concerned about fan speeds, so let's go kick up the fans. Okay, we have another 50 people in there, let's kick it up another 5%. And so with us, we do try to stay flexible. Again, it's the application that's more important. We do not ever want to think about these goods as commodity goods most of our projects end up being uh, custom projects of a bit of a, a larger scale uh, based on the customer needs. Well, I'd say based on your capabilities, it's always going to be custom because you're you're mm -hmm. using whatever tools are available to you. You know, it, whoever's favorite lighting control system is what you work with. And so, you know, you just achieve what you what you can with what you have. Whereas, you know, I guess if a, a lighting control system didn't have something that you needed, is there is there a, a roadblock there? Uh, it's not. So honestly, it's not because at the end of the day, the regular lighting and the germicidal don't really interact. Uh, we can have some triggers. Again, we if we want to, lights turning on in a space means that a space is occupied means turn on the fixtures, right? So basic intelligence, but for the most part, the system can stand alone. And a lot of our implementations are facilities that don't have lighting controls. You know, the most advanced lighting control that they have is instead of a wall switch, they have an occupancy sensor that turns on, you know, the lights just right. in you know, a nice little phase way. Uh, so in those cases, again, we, we've been building out with Kasambi. Um, we like, we like those guys there. Um, they have a nice track record in Europe and they're, uh, they're building up well here in North America, um, but we're flexible with, you know, with other people. So if a system doesn't have that or they don't want to be unified, I know in some schools and medical centers, they're so, so accurate and um, careful with their uh, IT that they don't want me to start to dive into their existing systems. We don't need to. So are there trade-offs? Like you mentioned, obviously, Kasambi a few times, right? Because that's what you're, you guys work with. Are there trade-offs with, you know, vendor A or vendor B's lighting control system that you can't provide the customer, but you get all that with Kasambi, which is why you're using them? 
Yes, I mean, if an existing infrastructure exists, we can make it work. Uh, Kasambi does have a few things that we do really like, though, um, just right out of the gate. And I really do hope that the Kasambi guys uh, buy me dinner next time they see me for <laughs> pushing up so much. <laughs> um, so, so you guys owe me if you're listening to this or when you listen to it. But um, they do have a few things. One is that they have a really, really open protocol, uh, meaning that it's so simple to create new hardware with their devices. It's a little CPU chip you can throw into existing fixtures, you can throw into any type of sensor, and all of a sudden it's Kasambi enabled. They're building a system uh, not on the hardware, but on the controls. And so that provides an immense amount of flexibility. So it's much more like a, the Android approach, while a lot of controls companies seem to be more that Apple approach, which is I want to control the software and I want to control the hardware. And if you don't, if the hardware doesn't exist that you're looking for, well, you're tough out of luck. While with Kasambi, it's okay. Um, let's see how we can go and make it happen. And then of course, uh, you know, most lighting controls uh, protocols are open and flexible enough that you can do what you need to do. When we're using, for example, a 254 nanometer system, we need to do inverse occupancy. You know, typically you walk into a space, lights turn on. We need to do the opposite. We also need to do where by code, typically with normal lighting, power goes out, you know, power comes back on and the lights kick on. We need the opposite. Power goes out, power comes on, UV lights stay off. And so with, for example, with Kasambi, that was easy enough to do. Uh, so they've been kind of our, our stock option. Uh, and you've also but, mentioned McWong in this. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it so, a similar situation? Yeah, so that's exactly where it is. You know, as I mentioned, Kasambi is software based, uh, or I should say the Bluetooth base. McWong is a hardware producer, right? And so the sensors themselves have been through McWong, um, and they've been a great company to work with. Uh, again, really responsive, and that's something that we look for. You know, look forward to, especially over the past year, two years, where there's been some crazy shortages and um, some difficulties with procuring materials. Yeah, they've been um, they've been really good at uh, going out of their way to help, and so uh, we try to we try to be good to the people that be good to us uh, and create relationships. I can think that's uh, the mo, whether it's with a customer, sure. whether it's with a vendor, with with anyone, um, do good uh, you know, and be. Rewarded. Yeah. So, but but I mean, again, you know, it's 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 not that these are the only option out there. You know, I, I no. know so many people who are like, this is the only system that I will ever specify. Go away, everybody else. And no. you know, it sounds like you'll you'll work with them. So. Yeah. As far as, it, you know, it's a rich environment for you guys to get involved in, in any kind of project. The other thing is that's really nice here uh, coming from the perspective of a specifier is that you do a lot of the legwork. So that way, as a specifier, I, if I'm just a lighting specifier, I can focus on what I do best and then defer to you guys for what you do best. And that way, there, at the end, it's an iron t ironclad specification exactly and it's something where you know no specifier is going to be able to do it all and no specifier should do it all right it should be something about exactly having that network of type relationships and trust and that's what we want to do with this field because it's a new field it is a different language than standard illumination we're not looking at foot candles um, honestly, at times we're not even looking at, you know, aesthetic as much as we might be looking at with, you know, standard, uh, spec rate, you know, lighting, we are looking at functionality. We are looking at research base. We are looking at science. There is a lot of learning that has gone behind the scenes to get here, um, that we love to share, but usually people start to doze off after we get too far <laughs> into it. So, so we just say, we'll take it ourselves and we'll, um, you know, build it out based on what you and your client need. Well, I, we're, we're almost out of time here, but, um, you know, I, I just want to summarize all this stuff because it's really cool stuff that, that you're doing here. And I think, you know, if, if we are trying to get further along in this process of having a better environment, you're going to be part of that solution there. So, I mean, you're, you're a company that basically studies air quality and how to control it. And not only just how to control it, how to verify that the quality of air is there, 
um, how to provide systems to meet the needs of that air quality. So whether it's pathogen specific or if it's you know, uh, pollution specific, you have the information, you have the tools at the ready, you will study the space if, if it's existing, if it's not existing, you'll, you'll study the, the conditions under which it will be installed. And then you will provide a holistic solution that integrates with a lighting control system so that you're able to really have this building automation style air quality control system that meets the needs of the client, which is really top notch i mean you know again coming from the perspective of amazon purchases it's like yeah you can get sucked into a giant rabbit hole of air filters and uv wands that that yeah okay fine maybe they do something i don't know but probably not and whereas you're like here is the solution here's the verification here's the proof here's the research um and so additionally one thing i i forgot uh, that I want to mention here is that because you're also tailoring the responses, you're reducing the carbon footprint of the space because instead of just brute forcing the the process, whatever it is, flushing the, the space with fresh air or flooding the space with UVC all times, you're actually collecting data and going, okay, how aggressive do we need to be in this space? If nobody's been in this space all day, you don't need to do anything because it's already cleared. Whereas if, if it's just been nonstop busy, full of people, then it needs a different approach and it needs to be tailored. And that way the owner knows they're not gonna waste energy on a, on a solution that they don't need. Exactly. When, when, when can you start? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Dan, thank you so much. Really appreciate you coming in. This is really fascinating stuff and, and would love to pick your brain in the future when there's more research, more stuff to talk about with this, because it seems to be an ever evolving topic. And so love to have you back on. For sure. Thanks for your time, guys. This has been a, a real joy and uh, happy to nerd out at any time. <laughs> Well, hopefully you had a great time listening to that because I certainly had a great time listening to Dan talk about UV lighting and lighting controls. Really cool stuff. Just want to thank our sponsor for this episode, McWong Inc. Check them out, McWongInc.com. They're a great option for Bluetooth mesh controls. They have award-winning solutions, DLC-certified products. They um, are North American-based. And if you're listening to this episode, they're a really great solution when you're doing your UV lighting and lighting controls because they provide really great hardware that's open to the needs of the, of the project and the system. They can integrate with that, with that UV system that we were talking about. So check them out. Also, if you're going to be at Leducation, check them out at booth 2902-2902. Definitely worth seeing what they have to offer if you're not familiar with them. And I just want to remind everyone that this episode is presented by the LCA, the Lighting Controls Association, and financially supported by Nailed, the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors. And do not forget to check out lightingcontrolspodcast.com for all of your sweet merch that you guys can get, uh, as well as all of our latest episodes, access to our social channels, and everything else you guys could possibly need. So thank you again, Dan. That was a great conversation. Until next time, have a good one.